The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, we're ready. Okay, so we'll continue the, um, just an overview of what's possible in the GUI before we start getting into an actual configuration workflow. So we're back into the uh, system settings, and this is basically uh, the settings, come on in, uh, the settings uh, that control the whole FreeNAS system. One of the things you can do by default, your web connection will be HTTP. You can change that to HTTPS. Uh, so your configuration is over an encrypted connection. If you do that, you're gonna wanna go to the SSL tab and this is a beta version, so it's not showing it. An SSL certificate should already be generated for you and shown there, but that will be an unsigned certificate. If you have your own signed certificate, you just paste it in that box, and that's what will be used for your HTTPS connection. If we go back to general, uh, the web GUI address, if you have multiple uh, interfaces uh, in the FreeNAS system, and you want to tie down the administrative control to one interface, for example, your internal interface, you can select that from the drop-down menu. By default, it is set to the wildcard of all zeros, which means it will listen for connections on all your interfaces. So for example, if you don't want people coming in on the public interface, you can tie it down to the administrative interface. Uh, another thing you can do for security by default is just going in either by port 80 or 443, depending on whether you're using HTTP or HTTPS. You can change the web GUI port that you go into to administer the system. If you are using um, a localized version of FreeNAS, uh, these are all the um, localizations that are available for the menus. Before you do that, you'll want to check the status of your localization at poodle.freenas.org. What happens is if the language is not 100% translated, the untranslated menu sections will display in English. So if you're only getting partial um, in your language, that's the reason why. And we encourage people, if you care about a fully localized language, if you can contribute the missing menu strings uh, using the Poodle interface. One of the things that was just added was a, uh, a console keyboard map. So for those of you that aren't using an English keyboard, because uh, we do have a lot of users in other parts of the world, so you can pick out your keyboard layout. You can set your time zone, the other thing that a lot of users will notice, and it depends upon uh, how you lay out your system, by default, the logs uh, go into var, which is on uh, a memory. So you actually lose your logs if the system reboots. And that can be really irritating if you are troubleshooting why a system is panicking or freezing, because you're not gonna be able to see your logs to see what happened. If that's the case, or if you um, prefer to have your log sent to another server on the network, um, if you have a syslogd server running, you just simply input the IP address. At this point, only syslogd is supported, so you do need some sort of Unix system uh, running syslogd. But then it's just a simple matter of inputting the IP address. Yes? Sorry. Yes, definitely, yeah. And I'll show you that when we get to the networking section. So this is your general uh, settings in advanced. Um, by default, that console menu that we saw when I was trying to set up my IP address, uh, that will display. You can turn that off so it doesn't display, but you'll wanna have alternate um, ways of getting into the system. Um, you can enable power D. What else? We got the console messages. Uh, the other thing that happens, and this can be handy if you are um, 
writing a ticket. So we do have a track system where people can submit tickets for bugs. By default, if there is a bug in the uh, Django code and you try to do something that it doesn't like, it will uh, pop up a menu with the trace back. So if you're uh, experiencing that, just copy and paste it into your ticket and they can usually tell pretty quickly where the problem is and how to fix it. That auto-tune thing, auto thing that I mentioned is disabled by default. If you turn it on, auto-tune is designed to run at boot time, which means you'll have to reboot the system in order for it to probe your hardware and to change some of your settings. And in a minute when we do SysCTLs, I'll show you where those settings uh, get set so that you can look to see what auto-tune did to your system. We have a couple of buttons down here. So if you are dealing with Active Directory or Open LDAP um, and, you, and, a new, and a new user is added to the database, that user won't show up until the next day when a cron job runs to update all that stuff. If you need that user now, you come in and you click that button and it will synchronize um, with the domain controller. This is a handy one. This one's called Save Debug. It's probably not going to look exciting if I click on it. That's assuming, we'll see. We'll see how internet's going to go. If you are submitting a support ticket, one of the things you can do is click on this. It will create a text file that will have all kinds of information, such as your FreeNAS revision, um, your log files, um, all kinds of stuff. So it's very easy to create one of those, and it will have uh, a lot of debugging information for the developers. Uh, when I show you how to upgrade, this is where you go to upgrade. So basically, you download that file that had the name upgrade in it. You click on firmware upgrade. We haven't made a volume yet, so we can't apply an update. So we'll do a, an update once we have a volume. The other thing uh, you can do, if you already have a plugins jail and you do an upgrade, uh, you should come in and import your plugins jail and that will put it back in the GUI so all of your settings will show back up in the GUI. Well, um, before you leave that page, yep. um, actually to go up a little bit, mm -hmm. the setting I recommend is the PowerD. Uh, it, I use it so I can turn down my fans on the CPU. Okay. Uh, And you've had good luck with it? Mm -hmm. We get so many complaints from people that says it didn't do what they thought it would do, but <laughs> I'm glad to hear somebody had good luck with it. Um, email, um, this isn't where you set the email address for the root user that receives the administrative um, alerts and that. Instead, this is where you um, actually set your email settings. So this is the address that the system will send the email as so where the email appears to come from. Uh, you can set your outgoing mail server and your port numbers. Uh, we do support SSL and SMT off, and you can put in that configuration information. You can also send a test email to make sure that your email is working correctly. And SSL is basically where you go in and you set uh, your certificate for this will be used for HTTPS connections and for secure FTP. SysCTLs is interesting. So anybody who's familiar with FreeBSD will know that we have a mechanism called SysCTL. It's typically used at the command line. Um, Linux has it as well, but doesn't use it as often as FreeBSD does. Uh, so FreeBSD is used quite often and it's used to tune a running system. So the point of SysCTL is it will tell you basically everything that the kernel understands and is doing. And it, um, I can actually show you on this system, because this is FreeBSD base. GL. So I just asked for all of the SysCTLs. And what you get is something called MIBs. So almost like an SNMP where you have your OIDs, uh, these are um, dot limited. 
So basically, this is everything about the kern, and you have various MIBs for the kernel. Uh, there's actually millions of these. So we got the CAM subsystem, the GEOM subsystem. At some point, we'll hit the networking stuff. So it can just like go on forever. Uh, we got kernel features. We got the options that were built into the kernel. We got all of the devices that the kernel understands. Uh, we got the virtual memory system. So basically, there are literally thousands of MIBs that describe what's happening on that system. Typically, if you are tuning a FreeBSD-based system, you're going through something like the FreeBSD handbook or some sort of how-to, and it will say to bump up ZFS performance if, say, if you have low RAM, you should set the, these sysctl parameters, and you could, should set them to these values. And typically what you do is you test it on a test system first to see how the system reacts when you change the value. So as soon as you set a sysctl, the kernel starts doing whatever it is that you asked for that MIB. So it's how you tune a live running system. Typically, if on a FreeBSD-based system, we just run the sysctl command. Uh, we give it the name of the MIB, and we give it the value that we want to set it to, and it shows that it set it from this value to that value. Here we get a nice pretty GUI where you can go in and do that. So here you would type in the MIB name, so kern.ipc.whatever. You would type in whatever value you want to go into that sysctl. Uh, you have the option to write in a comment so you remember why you changed this value. And if you're playing around with tuning, um, you can enable or disable that value um, while you're doing it. The nice thing is any sysctls that you set will be listed here and it'll show what the values are. If you run that auto-tune script, if it changes any sysctl values, they will show up there. And if what auto-tune thought would work for your system isn't working for your system, you would go in and edit that value and change, change its numeric value. So that's how we do sysctls. I'm going to jump down to tunables because tunables are sort of the same. So on a FreeBSD system, we have a file called bootloader.conf, and that file is read to determine if any additional drivers should be loaded, and also if you want to load a specific kernel modules to add support for things. This one gives you a GUI where you can do the same thing. So, for example, if you have a piece of hardware and that driver is not loaded by default, you can write down the name of um, the loader.comp variable, and typically the value will be the word yes in capitals, because you're basically saying yes, I want you to load uh, this driver, this module during boot up. Again, you can write a comment so you remember why, and any tunables or loaders that you add will be listed at their values, so you can know what additional things you're loading on that system. Again, auto-tune, if it um, changes a loader value for you, it decides that something else should be loaded to support your hardware, it will um, be listed here, and you can change that um, if it's not working for you. I don't know why we're getting feedback today. Okay, so those are your sysctls and tunables. The other thing, uh, the last thing in system is your system information, and it basically um, gives you inf information about your build. A lot of people, especially on the forums and IRC, will ask them what version of FreeNAS are you running, and they usually tell us the FreeBSD version because they looked at uname. Uh, that doesn't help us. Uh, we really need to know your revision number. And uh, if you're running a release, we need to know things like it's 804P2 and not just 804 release because things do change uh, between versions, especially if you are debugging stuff. A lot of features get fixed between versions. So that's your system. 
If we take a look at networking, uh, FreeNAS supports a lot of cool networking stuff. Uh, we do have a global configuration. By default, you're going to get a uh, host name and a domain. And by default, your FreeNAS system is not available from an external network. And that's by design. You don't want just anybody coming in and playing with your FreeNAS system. That does mean if you need to access your system from another subnet in your internal network or from the internet, you're going to have to go in and set the gateway and DNS information. It's not going to work until you do that. So by default, it's designed to just be on your local subnet. Interfaces. It will show you what interfaces um, have been defined. And typically, if we're adding an interface, what we're really doing is we're adding aliases. So by default, it'll probe all of your real interfaces, but you can add virtual interfaces uh, if that's part of your requirement. So typically, that's what we use this screen for. We do have link aggregations. And you're not going to have fun with link aggregations if your router does not support LACP because most of the link aggregation protocols, um, it's an 802.1Q, no, AB, it's one of the 802.1s. Yeah, AB. And usually um, you're going to need some sort of LACP support on it. At the very least, you're going to need one AB support on the router. So it's not going to be a home Soho router, it's going to be a um, you know, um, commercial grade router. There are various um, algorithms that are supported, and if you go to the documentation, um, it describes the features of each type of algorithm and what's required. Network summary will show you uh, basically all of your interfaces and how they're currently set up. Static routes, if you do need to reach other parts of your network, by default you're limited to your local subnet. So if you need to add routes, you can just go in and add uh, the name of the network and the gateway that you use to get there. And VLANs, we do have VLAN support. Uh, obviously your uh, router is going to have to already be set up or your router bridge um, for the VLANs. Uh, you're going to have to have already created your VLAN tag in your network and you can come in here and uh, input the tag so that it can uh, participate in the VLAN network. So that's networking. Storage we're going to play a lot with because um, basically that's the whole point of a NAS. We'll be talking about periodic snapshot tasks and replication tasks, as well as all the things you can do with your volumes and your scrubs. Sharing, the three main types of sharing are going to be for um, Mac, Unix, and Windows networks, and we'll be talking more about those in the configuration overview. And the last thing I want to show you is the services. These are all the services that are built into FreeNAS. And one of the things that's going to be different in this tab on an 8.2 system, this is where we go in and start our services. And by default, all services are off until you start them. The services that come with the core NAS are going to be listed under core. And as you start installing plugins, the software that you install will be added to the plugins tab so you can go in and start and stop those services. So that you won't see on a pre-82 system. Sorry? Right now there you have to be in the 82 series which is still in beta. Um, the latest beta was beta 3 and don't use it because it's changed since then. The plugins don't work. So you can use the ISO I gave you today or the 82 beta 4, which is due out next week. Is there a stable build that works with the plugin? Yes, which is what we're doing. 
So we have something called night lease where the, the changes are integrated each night for the upcoming release and you can download that from SourceForge as well. Now, the nice thing about coming to a course um, before we have a, a beta four is the new plugins are still being tested, so they're not online yet. So you're like the first people in the world to play with them. So that's, what, that's why you come to events like this. Um, the core services, if you have Active Directory in your network, you're gonna have to tell it uh, some information about your um, PDC so it can import those users. Um, if you've created SIF shares, nothing happens until you, until you start the SIF service, and you should take a look at the default SIF service settings first to make sure it matches your network and your requirements. And we'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, for home users, it's typically not seen so much in the workplace. Uh, we do have support for dynamic DNS. So you basically tell it who your provider is. And the docs do have ways uh, to tell you how to add a, a provider that doesn't show in the drop-down menu. So if you're using DDNS, uh, you can configure it for that. FTP. Uh, who all plays with iSCSI or has ever played with iSCSI? Yeah, so there's a boatload of um, terminology that you have to sort of wrap your head around and there's a whole bunch of steps to setting up iSCSI. Basically, the order that you see here is the order that makes most sense when you're setting up your iSCSI on a FreeNAS system. And we can go through that in the configuration workflow if anybody's interested. If you're trying to integrate with an LDAP network, you're gonna to have to give some information about the LDAP server so it can find it. If you've made NFS shares, you're going to need to start the NFS service. This is where we'll be adding our plugins this afternoon. Uh, we'll be doing a test rsync. If you have set up smart tests, they don't run until you start the smart service. So you have to remember to do that. Uh, we do have um, some SNMP. It is a stripped down version of SNMP uh, called BSNMP. And there's information about that in the docs. What sort of stuff is that Very little. And I've had a hard time trying to get information on the database of MIBs that are available. So that's something I'd like to get more information on. Was that the future Not sure. So they started with that because it's very uh, quick and easy. We have had people in the forums um, talk about various MIBs that they use and have found useful. Um, so we're still not too sure about that. But um, the person who wrote the daemon didn't put in the man page all of the, the MIBs, so that's the part that we have to work on. That's the part that needs to be documented. Uh, TFTP, if you have um, images from your network devices that you want to set up, uh, you can set up your TFTP uh, server. And for UPS, we do use NUT. So any driver that's supported by NUT will show up in your drop-down menu. Uh, we have a couple of other uh, buttons here. So that was underneath our services. So if you want a quick top on what's happening on the system, it's read-only, so you can't go in and, and issue kill commands. Uh, you want to use shell if you want to do that, but it is a quick way to see what's happening on the system. We do have shell, which is my favorite place to be, and it is a full-fledged shell. Uh, you can do anything that comes with FreeBSD. Um, you can do uh, from the shell prompt. You can uh, reboot the system. Uh, it's going to turn your screen red because it does affect users if you reboot and the same was shut down. A couple of last things we have here, we do have help and it has hyperlinks to all of the help. So all the documentation, the IRC, um, the forums, the mailing lists, and the bug tracker. So they're all there as a hyperlink. And if you want to log out, we have a log out button. 
So that's basically the layout um, of the system. So let's take a look at our configuration workflow. So there's all the cool stuff I can do. Now what do I do? So if you're following along in your PDF, it starts on page 27. So once you've gone into your system, you've set your account, your email address, you got your console logging going, you're ready to go. First thing you want to deal with is basically your storage. You want to tell FreeNAS, these are the disks I want you to use, and this is what I want you to do with them. We do this under storage volumes, because you're basically creating volumes. We've gone back and forth on how to name the various screens, because there's a it's hard to get a name that's consistent between UFS and ZFS, so it'd be nice to call it pools and stuff like that, but it wouldn't work for UFS. So we call it volumes, it's a little bit confusing, um, but, but I'll show you how to go through these. You basically have three choices when you're setting up your storage. You can do something called auto-import. And auto-import, a lot of people are disappointed when they do this and nothing shows up. If nothing shows up, it means that FreeNAS does not recognize that you have existing software RAID set up on your system. So auto-import means you already have a UFS mirror stripe or G-RAID 3, or you already have an existing ZFS stripe mirror RAID Z1, RAID Z2. That's the only thing that it will understand. So if you have those, you obviously want to keep your data, so you want to auto-import it in. So this only works for existing UFS, ZFS software rate. The other thing that you can do, uh, remember cancel next time, so you can do an import. And an import means I have a disk, so it's not in rate, it's just a single disk and it already has data and it's been formatted with one of the four following supported file systems. So that's what I can do with that of import. So if you're a home user and you already have a, an NTFS drive full of stuff that you want to make available through FreeNAS, you go in and you import that disk. If you're starting from scratch, what you really want to do is to format your volumes. So the only time you pick volume manager is if you're thinking erase what's on the disk, let's start with something new. So I'm not importing in existing data. And how come I'm, oh yes, your system only had two. I was looking at mine thinking, where'd, where'd my 10 gig, 10 gig drives go? So what you see in here depends upon what you select. So it will show you all of the disks that it recognizes. So I can go in and select the disks. Since I only have two disks, basically I can only create a mirror or a stripe. If I had three disks, um, depending upon what file system I picked, with UFS, if I had three disks, I could also do a, uh, a RAID 3. And with ZFS, if I had three or more disks, I would see things like RAID Z1, RAID Z2. So the options you see down here depend upon how many disks that you have. Before you create your volumes, especially if you're doing it for the first time, it's really useful to go through um, that ZFS requirements um, thing that we um, went through at the beginning if you're using ZFS, because you're going to want to pick the optimum number of disks and their sizes and the RAID C that is uh, good for you. If you're just playing, you can just go in and pick anything. So I'm just gonna call this volume one. We'll go for ZFS. Because I'm playing, I'll just do a stripe uh, because it's fast and it'll give me the best space. Uh, typically, real world, my initial volume wouldn't be a stripe because there's no redundancy. Um, yeah, I won't be able to show an extent. The other thing that will be an issue for the next year or so, especially if you're using ZFS, so uh, the newer drives um, default to this sector size, um, but older drives didn't always do that. So if you're setting up a ZFS and your drives are older than a year old, you probably want to check this. 
Um, otherwise, you're going to have to check to see what the default sector size is. Um, when you add a volume, you'll notice in red it is reminding you we're not importing existing data. If there's anything on this disk, it's going to be destroyed because we're formatting uh, with the file system that you specified. So I'm going to create a volume. When you're creating volumes, um, ZFS is usually fairly quick. UFS, depending upon the size of the disk, may take some time because it's formatting the disk. So if you have very large disks, just wait until your screen comes back. Once it's finished doing its formatting, you'll notice that you get a new entry under volumes. And this is the name of the volume. And a volume name will always start with MNT. Because I've created a ZFS volume, I get some extra stuff thrown in under that. I can go in and create data sets, and I can create ZVols. So if I'm setting up my storage pool, so I've fed it a lot of disks, um, if I have many, many disks to choose from, I've decided upon my best group size, and I've made my um, RAID Z for that group size. If I have disks left over, I can go in and make another one and stripe it, and it'll just add it all to the pool. I then want to decide, if I have this big storage pool, do I want to start dividing it into areas, either to give users their own storage space, or maybe I need certain areas that need to be compressed, or I'm thinking of doing deduplication on certain areas. That's where you can go in and create a data set. So I'm going to create a data set. Again, anything you make in ZFS, as soon as you create it, it takes up no space. It's only when you start using it that it starts to use space as you start to write data to it. When you're creating a data set, if you don't set a quota or a reserve space, the entire pool of space is available to that data set. If you want to limit it to a certain size, you go in and set a quota for it. Um, regardless of which way you go, the only space that gets used is the space that's written to. Yes? I know what deduplication it does, yes. And one of the things that's going to be irritating um, at least until 10 comes out in FreeBSD. So the way that ZFS works on FreeBSD now, it's not very good at telling you what space is available. And usually what it tells you is lying. <laughs> so we, we get a lot of complaints from FreeNAS users saying, it's saying I have more space than I have this size. No, it'll lie. So, and the thing that's going to fix that is called ZFSD, which has not been committed to FreeBSD yet and won't be until 10. Now, what the FreeNAS people are thinking of doing, because it's really a big deal, knowing how much space you really do have, is as soon as they put it in 10, they'll try to MFC it back to whatever version we're on right now. Because until we have ZFSD, you're not going to get accurate numbers. Yeah, so it's the ZFS daemon, and it's designed to accurately monitor this space. The other thing that we'll find will be an irritation until ZFSD is in is hot swapping will not work well because it doesn't always notify ZFS. ZFS doesn't always notify the kernel that, hey, I'm removing a disk and I'm adding it to the pool. So that's something that you have to be careful of as well if you're in a hot swap environment. Once CFSD is out, uh, that will solve both problems. Now, I haven't up to this point mentioned TrueNAS, which is the commercial version of FreeNAS. And it is FreeNAS, and typically what you're buying is the hardware to run it on and the support that goes with it. Um, the newest version of TrueNAS that just came out is based on FreeBSD 9, and they put Z, um, a prototype version of ZFSD into it. And then 
once that gets tested well, I'm sure it'll find its way into FreeNAS. But that was something that was a really big deal to corporate customers, yes. We need to be able to hot swap our drives. Okay, so we, knew we have a volume, so you can create a data set. If you're planning on doing iSCSI, you have two choices. You can create something called a file extent or create something called a device extent. A file extent is handy because it basically allows you to set up uh, the size of the area. So I can create a file extent that's 40 gigs, tell iSCSI about that, and it will export 40 gigs worth of space. So that means this is the only thing I can do on a UFS system, is create a file extent. On ZFS, the better thing to do is to create a device extent, because they are faster, and it emulates a raw disk, and ZFS supports that. So that's known as a ZVOL. So when you're creating a ZFS volume, and again, this is where um, nomenclature gets a little icky, you may think, well, I just made a volume. Why am I making a ZFS volumes? Well, here you made your pool. Here you're really creating a device extent to use with iSCSI. Did you actually make that data set? No. No, I canceled it. Yeah. And when you create your device extent, you say how big you want it to be, and it emulates a raw disk of that size. And they're much faster than file extents. So if you're using ZFS, make Zvols. If you're using iSCSI. Yep. Right. Yeah. So one of the things I can show you here, so we already have a volume. No, that's the wrong place. If I go back into Volume Manager, it's not going to be that exciting because we only had two disks. Um, but we can do something called Extend a Volume if I give it an existing volume name. And if I had more disks to choose, I could extend that and it would add that disk to whatever my current configuration is. Now, there are some limitations depending upon what your current configuration is. So if you are using a Stripe, no limitations. Add whatever disk you need, and if you lose your data, you lose your data. Um, if you're doing a mirror, you should add the same number of disks in your existing mirror. If you're doing one of the RAID Zs, you've already in your mind decided what your group size will be, so add the same number of disks as your group size. But that's how you go in and add more storage capacity. The other thing that you can do, which um, isn't as convenient, but it really depends upon your hardware and whether you can physically add more disks. If you decide, I don't have room to add more disks, but I want to bump up to bigger disks, what you can do is one at a time, swap out disks, wait for it to resilver, swap out the next disk. So that's your other alternative for more disk space. But if you have the room, it's really nice to be able to extend. Um, I'll just make a note before I, I answer that question. Um, in 8.2, we added this volume to extend because a lot of people were getting lost in 8.04. We didn't have this. We just told you put in the same volume name, and people were panicking because it said existing data will be cleared. Yes, and I would panic at that myself. And actually, I see they still have it here even if I'm extending, so I'll have to make a note about that. So if you're extending, it doesn't exist data, increases capacity. Yep. ZFS is happiest and performs best when they're the same size, but it will let you put in different sizes. Now, depending upon your configuration, if it's any type of rage, you may be limited to your smallest size disk. So that, that's always a consideration with RAID. Correct. Yeah. It will perform optimally when all disks are the same size. But it'll still, um, it'll still continue to perk along while you're getting there. OK. Uh, any questions before we leave step one? So basically, you're telling FreeNAS what devices are available to it. You're either importing in existing software RAID. 
you're importing in a disk already containing data, or you're creating your volumes. So that's the first thing that we do in our configuration workflow. And those were pages 27 to 30 in the PDF. Once you have some volumes, the next thing is you're going to want to start thinking permissions. So who's going to be having access to these volumes? And you have three choices when it comes to permissions. You can either, if you have an existing Active Directory domain, import all that information in. If you have an existing LDAP domain, import all that information in. And if you have neither, you can start manually creating users and groups. The other thing that you need to decide is, and it's going to really depend upon how your network is set up, is things like, A, is anonymous access OK for my network? Or do I really want to limit what users can do and what they have access to? If anonymous access is good enough for your network, you probably don't even have to create a user. So for example, if you're going uh, real easy and just want FTP access to data for the people at home, um, we already have a built-in FTP user account. Use that, set up anonymous FTP, and you're good to go. Now, if you're in a more complex environment where users have to have all their own home directories, people aren't allowed to see other people's data, then you start really deciding, how do I lay out my permissions? How do I get those users in? So that's going to be really specific uh, to what it is that you're trying to do. So that's where a lot of users say, well, how come there's just not a really quick how-to on how to set this up? There's just so many different ways you can set things up. So what we try to do in the documentation for each type of service to give examples. So in a Windows environment, how do I allow access without users having to input a password? Or how do I allow access where everybody has to authenticate and it grabs the information off my Active Directory? So it's really going to be specific to the needs of your network, what you do. So basically, those are your three choices, Active Directory, LDAP, or make your own. If you are making your own, yep? Active Directory, does it support single sign-on or do you just their domain credentials? I know it supports domain credentials. I haven't seen a how-to for single sign-on, so I don't know. And if anybody plays with it and it actually works, putting a how-to on the forums would be really awesome. Or making a wiki account and adding it to the documentation would be awesome as well. Because there's just so many scenarios, it's always useful for a specific scenario for somebody to write, this is the steps that I did to get there. If you do end up making users, uh, we'll just take a quick look at that uh, user screen again. So it's really helpful if you're familiar with the Unix way of making users. Uh, Windows um, admins sometimes um, don't find it to be um, quite what they're used to. So basically, it's going to give you a user ID. It's going to automatically bump it up for you. One of the things you can do is if you already have existing data with existing user IDs, is you can change that to match uh, what your needs are. You're going to give a username. We already talked about the primary group thing. You shouldn't really be playing with that. This is the part that people forget to do, though. By default, the home directory does not exist, which means there is no storage available to that user. So what you need to do if you're making your users manually is you want to decide what are they going to have access to. So are they going to have access to the full volume, the full storage pool? If so, I should be writing, I should be picking mount volume one, because this is the volume I've created in this network. If I've gone and created data sets, I want to decide well, what am I doing with these data sets? Am I giving each user their own data set to play with? Um, am I giving groups 
uh, data set? How am I actually dividing up my data? So it's going to be very specific uh, for you. So if you decide to do the data set thing, you're going to want to create your data sets first before you create your users and then assign users to data sets. So as long as their home directory um, shows it's non-existent, that user isn't getting at the storage data. And that's probably the, the number one thing that people get lost at. My users can't get at anything, and that's why. Uh, the home directory mode is going to be specific to this user, and uh, you can decide whether groups or others have access to their home directory. The only time you have to set a shell is if users are SSHing in and they care, they know what a shell is and know what they want. Uh, you're going to set things like the full name, email, passwords. And you can disable password logins, and it really depends upon what type of share that you're using. So if you are creating SSS, SSH shares and you don't want the user coming in through SSH, you should disable password logins. Yes? Yes, yes. And there was a couple of things before we had shell. Um, admin had to actually go into SSH in to set permissions. So for example, for an SSH CH root, those have to be done manually uh, just because of the way it works. Now that we have web shell, it's so much easier uh, to go in. Um, and again, dealing with data sets, you may decide to do things on group basis. So you may make groups that get associated with certain data sets. If that's the case, you'll want to make sure that the user is a member of the group uh, that you want them to have access to. Creating groups, there's really not much to it. Uh, it's going to suggest an ID for you. Uh, which you can change. You're going to give the group a name. And you can check this box if you already have existing uh, group permissions, say in uh, Active Directory. Sorry. And you want to um, let that group also share that ID to match up the group. So this is something that you can add as well. Once you somehow have your, uh, where am I here? Yeah, I want to view volumes. Once you have either imported your users or you've created your users, the permissions actually get set on the volume itself. Yeah, where's our permissions? There it is. And this is often confusing to users as well. So if you're manually creating your users, you should already know ahead of time, are they going to live in a volume or a data set? And make sure that's their home directory. You're also then going to want to go to your volumes and data sets and set the starting permissions and the starting ownership on that. So in a volume, when it says owner and user, this is basically the person who has the ability to change permissions on that portion of storage. So you can uh, either leave it at root or wheel, or you can specify it to a specific user or group. The mode is going to be the Unix style, which gets ignored uh, if you change it to Windows, because that's going to add your Windows uh, ACL ability to it. When you're deciding what mode to use, it's always safe to use Unix because every client operating system out there understands Unix style permissions. So your basic read, write, execute. If you are in an active directory domain, you're not going to get the full extended attributes provided within that domain if you don't pick Windows. But that means that all of the clients in the network have to be able to understand Windows ACLs. So it really depends upon how your network is set up. 
What you have to be careful of is your mode and this set permission recursively thing. So this mode doesn't mean that only root and wheel has these set of permissions. So this is the user and owner that basically has the ability to change permissions. And these are the starting permissions on the share. Once the share has been created and people start creating data from the client, they can fine tune the permissions. So these are the starting permissions, but then once the client gets there, they can do what they want. So users can put tighter permissions on their own files and directories. You want to give them enough permissions that they can get in through the share in the first place. Be very cautious about checking this box, especially if there's existing data on the volume or data set. The way that FreeNAS sets permissions recursively. It sort of has to loop through the Unix ones, then the Windows ones, and then it does a check. It takes a fair bit of time, and it's CPU intensive. So it can actually bog down the FreeNAS system if it's busy. So what we recommend is if you need to change permissions recursively, do it on the client. That way all the work is happening at the client end. It's not going to affect users of the FreeNAS system. We've got two minutes. Have I lost anybody here? Because it usually it's permissions that people get stuck on. They'll say, I made my share and nobody can access it. What's happening? OK. So you have volumes. You somehow got users into the system. You've set permissions. And then we get into sharing. And I'll see what I can say about sharing in a minute and a half. You basically have three choices when it comes to sharing. And if you read the documentation, uh, so we have a whole chapter on sharing, it says pick one type of sharing. And what you pick is going to depend upon the types of clients running in your network. And also, your um, needs for speed when it comes to network performance, because different types of shares uh, have different performance. The reason why we tell people to pick one type of share, and this is per storage volume or data set. So this is another reason why people make data sets. Maybe they want their Windows users to get at this data, their Mac users to get at that data. And we can do that using data sets and sharing uh, data sets with different shares. But for the same volume or data set, don't set up multiple types of shares. And a classic example of that deals with file locking. If I have one user coming in through Windows and a Unix user happens to open the same file, NFS will lock that file, but the Windows user won't know that because it's coming in through SIFs. So you'll actually end up with two people um, changing a file at the same time, what's going to happen to that file? So NF, uh, locking is one reason. Another reason, if you have a mix of, say, Windows and Mac users, and Windows users look at the files in their directory, and there's all these weird names, they say, well, I'm going to get rid of the, delete the stuff, I don't know what it is. They may end up deleting all of your Apple fork, Apple double data. So you don't want confused users like that. So you pick one type of sharing. And I think that's all we'll do um, before lunch. So when we come back, we'll talk more about sharing, which type is appropriate for which client. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisk. 
The gym has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again. This time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people. Uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is a key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, 
you can pick up whatever suits you better. Wellstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. Then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the Cloud Stack.